Okay, Astronomy 1020, we're back after suffering a hideous glitch that cost us a lot of time. Um, I was about to draw the HR diagram for you. I'm going to do that, and then we'll do our lab on binary stars. Let's go to speaker view, and let's try to catch what we missed there. Okay, uh, introducing the HR diagram, the Kurtzsprung-Russell diagram. Although astronomers call it the HR diagram for short. The HR diagram is probably the single most important uh, graph in all of us astronomy. And you guys need to memorize it well for your exam. We have a vertical and a horizontal axis. The x-axis plots spectral type. O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. Okay. And what this means is that you're actually plotting the temperature of the star, but you're plotting it towards the right. So the left side of the diagram has hot stars. In fact, let's, let's make this more dramatic. I'm gonna put O, B, and A in blue, because these are blue stars. And K and M stars, I will put in red. Remember, black bodies work opposite the way the, the colors on your faucet sink work. The red stars are cool, and the blue stars are hot. On the y-axis, we plot either the luminosity, but what uh, professional astronomers usually plot is they plot absolute magnitude. And usually in such a way that the more luminous stars are up at the top. Class, do you expect there to be a relationship between the luminosity of a star and its temperature? Are those two things related yeah. to each other? Yes, everyone says, why? Who's got a good memory? Why is the luminosity related to temperature? What? I glow because I'm hot. Yeah, that's brightness, though. It's because of the Stefan Boltzmann law for stars, which is kind of like I glow because I'm hot. It's the luminosity of a star is proportional to the radius squared times the temperature to the fourth. And that's why I had to talk to you about that before I could tell you this graph. There's a relationship between the light output of a star and its temperature, but it's kind of more complicated than that. What we actually see when we uh, plot this, oh, I had to close everything because I was freaking out. We actually find that most of the stars kind of fall along this diagonal, but not all of the stars do. And here's where the story is interesting, but also kind of hard to explain the first time around. This is a real plot of an HR diagram made by the Hipparchos satellite. And before I try to draw it, I wanna show you a real version so that you can get a sense of what's going on. This is a plot of maybe a thousand stars on an actual HR diagram. And what you can see is most of the stars, almost all of them fall in this kind of weird diagonal known as the main sequence. And this is where there's a tight relationship between the light output of a star and its temperature, okay? However, um, some stars are not found in the main sequence. Some stars are found over here. And this is what is gonna be known to you guys as the red giant branch. Have you guys ever heard of red giants before? Stars that swell to massive sizes yeah. and swallow up planets? This is a different stage of a star's life. When it starts to die, they, they expand themselves to death. There's also a few stars that are kind of found up here, and there's a few stars that are found down there. And it turns out that these different zones 
these different zones of the HR diagram are, are basically like different stages in a star's life, but that's not obvious right away. Let's see if we can reproduce some of the main features. Most of the stars on an HR diagram, they fall along this kind of diagonal line, which is known as the main sequence, okay? So this is the main sequence. This is where stars are, ending, are fusing hydrogen into helium. So most stars are found on the main sequence. But there's a branch of stars that are found up here, kind of like in a big lump. And these are the red giants, or they call this the red giant branch. Then there's a group of stars that are found, not too many of them, <clears throat> but a group of stars that are found up here, this zone is called the blue supergiants. The blue supergiants are an extraordinarily massive and uh, very luminous band of, it's a type of red giant that's so uh, hot, it's not red anymore, it's blue. And then last but not least, there's a kind of stellar graveyard just in time here for Halloween, the land of dead husks of stars known as the white dwarfs. And these stars are basically the exposed cores of dead stars. And this group down here are called white dwarfs. The reason why this graph is so cool is it starts off as a simple relationship between how bright a star is and how hot a star is. And before you know it, you're witnessing the entire life cycle of a star in a graph form. I'd like to mention two other things about this graph that are kind of important. The mass of a star increases diagonally up into the left of the HR diagram. And you're eventually gonna to need to know that. The radius of a star increases diagonally to the right. What's so cool about an HR diagram is an HR diagram, once you put a star there, will tell you every piece of information you need to know about the physics of a star. Remember that I told you the four key parameters of a star are M, L, R, and T. A star has four parameters, M, L, R, and T, can all be gleaned by analyzing them on an HR diagram. Okay, these are the four key properties or four key parameters, which can all be gained. Hey, um, I'm gonna ask you guys a thought question just to get your physics noodle cooking here at the end of the day. Suppose you had to take a guess of which of these properties, what's the middlemost star? Um, what do you mean, uh, Christopher, I'll answer that question, but I need you to refine your question. What do you like, mean? One that would be like in the exact middle of the chart. Oh, actually. Like just kind middle of the middle of the road of all of them. Well, our sun is close to the middle. It's right around here. But there's a group of stars that are located right about here called pulsating variable stars. And there's a certain class of star, they call it the instability strip. And when you're right in the middle, those stars actually tend to pulsate. They're not in hydrostatic equilibrium and they grow and shrink like an accordion. Those stars play a vital role in astronomy, but I, I can't tell you it all in one day, all right? I gotta tell you this in pieces. Let me ask you another thought question, Christopher, or anyone who's brave enough to try to answer. One of these parameters is more important than the others. Mass, luminosity, radius, temperature. If you had to take a guess as to which parameter had the biggest effect on the life and evolution of a star, which of the properties would you guess is the most important property of a star? It's mass. Yes, and why, Austin? You're right there and swinging. Well, the well, okay, Dad, please stop. I know this one. I've watched a lot of YouTube about this. Big stars glow hot as fuck, and then Hold they on. burn When up. you say big stars, 
You mean radius? Big to me means radius, dude. No, well, more massive stars get it. Mass. They blow. They glow hotter, and then they burn up quicker. So then, smaller mass stars have longer lives. So what does that tell us? Um, so Austin, you are your intuition is is dead on. You got this just right. Why would mass be the number one driver? The single most. run sack. That's what happens when I play basketball. <laughs> Are we playing b-ball? Are we talking stars here? I can't even see you. You're trolling me. Don't play me like that. Well, Austin, for someone who's shooting hoops, for someone who's clearly distracted, you did have some good ideas. Um, can anyone else think about why, why mass? Would be Is it because there's more like, uh, there's more mass, there's more stuff, so there's more fuel, right? for the star to keep on living? That's not a bad way to say it, run sec. Here's how I would say it. Gravity drives the star, right? It is gravitational pressure that squeezes your star and makes it hot. And then yes, the run sack makes the nuclear fuel go crazy. If you have more gravity, your star just squeezes harder, it makes it hotter, makes it burn its nuclear fuel faster. Gravity, stars are big balls of gravity. That's what they are, okay? Okay, um, before we start our lab, I need to do something awkward here. Um, I had planned out my day just perfectly so that we could get to binary stars and then we would do our binary star lab. I lost about 15 minutes. Um, what I'm debating, and that's really bothering me because that means I've got to decide what to do. Do I tell you about binary stars or do I just try to do the lab? I'm worried if I try to do the lab. All right, I've got to make a decision. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to, I'm going to give you a very hasty set of notes. Like I'm not even really going to explain it to you. I just want you to write down what I write down here. And then we're going to pause and then we'll do a lab, okay? In our, by the way, do you guys know what a binary star is? It's like when you have two stars orbiting each other. That's right. A binary star is two stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. There are three types of binary star that we will study in our class, okay? And I want you to write down the three types in hopes that it will make the lab go smoother. The first is called a visual binary. A visual binary is when you can see the two stars and you can actually watch them orbit around each other. Okay? That type is quite rare. The second type is called an eclipsing binary. An eclipsing binary, you can only see one star but you know it's really two stars. And the way that you know it's really two stars is by taking something called the light curve. The light curve is a plot of brightness versus time. Now, if I hadn't lost so much time with that computer glitch, I would then explain this to you, but I'm not going to explain this to you now. I'm going to show it to you when we get to lab. The third type of star is called a spectroscopic binary. Like our friend, the eclipsing binary, is it uh, a run sack? It's not blurry on my viewing of my screen. It's blurry for me. Yeah, blurry for me too. Okay. So what's going on there? Is that an internet thing or is that a camera thing 
It might be, uh, do you have anything opened up that's consu that might be using too much Wi-Fi? No. I really don't. I could try closing my slideshow, but that's not going to be using Wi-Fi. I like, I basically dropped all of my tabs. It could have messed up when your Zoom crashed. Say that again? I said it could have messed up your camera when your Zoom crashed. No, no, no. The camera's fine because I'm looking through, I'm looking at my own screen and I'm looking through my own camera. On my end, it's crispy, guys. Is it still blurry for you? Is it so blurry that you can't read? I can read it. It's just it works. It works. Fuzzy. I can't read it. All right, all right. Here's what we're gonna do. Because it's blurry, I'll pull it closer. Is that better? Ish. All right. Ish. That's fine. Ish. I'm sorry. I I don't know what to do. Um, I don't have enough time to teach the class and troubleshoot my tech problems. That's the sucky thing that's happening now. Um. Okay. A spectroscopic binary, yeah, I will sue them, is, is also an unresolved pair. So once again, you can see one star, uh, but you know it's two. Okay. Um, the reason why is because you take the spectrum, and when you take the spectrum, you see two sets you don't see one absorption spectrum you see two sets of absorption spectra that shift back and forth and i really need to explain that to you guys but not today two sets of shifting absorption lines okay I've kind of cheated there and I took an extra 10 minutes to do that. Um, I'm sorry about that class. I'm very, very sorry. Um, I need to explain this better, but this will at least allow us to complete our lab today. Without this, our lab would have been difficult to complete. Okay, do you guys have these notes? Is there anyone still copying? Yeah, Professor, what is that uh, take spectrum and then the one, I can't, I can't read it, I'm sorry. Two sets of shifting absorption lines. I've, it's so weird that it's blurry for you guys. It's really clear on my end. It must be an internet thing. That's Let me try that again, Stacy. Two sets of shifting absorption lines. Got it, thank you. What does it say next to three? Spec, spec what? Spectroscopic binary. Maybe National Grid is working on the uh, the internet out there. Or sorry, uh, maybe Cox is out there messing with my cables. Okay. Today uh, did not go as smoothly as I would have liked. Um, should we take a little chill pill before we uh, get into the lab? Do we all want that? Okay. So let's take yeah. 15 minutes or so. It's it's 110 now, so 125, we'll get into it. Today's lab, we'll crank, we'll crank it out fast so that you're not uh, delayed, okay? I'll see you guys in a bit. Okay, friends, we're back and it's time for um, lab number eight. Uh, I have some tools that we're gonna need to do this lab today, not too much, just a clear plastic ruler, the lab booklet, a calculator, Christopher's singing his heart out here. Um, and some coffee might come in handy. Today's, um, <clears throat> today's lab is a little bit of a head scratcher on binary stars, okay? It's <clears throat> something closer to what a real astronomer does, but for that reason, it's a bit technical. And I'm trying to think about how we should best go about it. Perhaps we can start by looking at our lab packet together, okay? So let's share screen and um, <clears throat> uh, let's go over to our Blackboard and I'm gonna call that, that slide back up again. Binary star orbits. 
Um, before I try doing this on the phone, I'd like to just kind of show you guys how this works uh, here in our share screen mode. I want to talk to you guys about an eclipsing binary star. In an eclipsing binary star, remember that I told you uh, before we ended class that usually what happens is you can only see a single star in the sky. And even though you see one twinkling star, you very quickly discover that there must be more than one star there. Why? The reason why is because you plot something called a light curve. Do I have a, a blank piece of paper here? Um, let me clean this up. Okay. <clears throat> in, in stellar astronomy, a light curve is when you make a plot, okay? And the quantities you plot are on the x-axis, you plot time in days. And on the y-axis, you plot brightness in, uh, remember, we do brightness in watts per meter squared, OK? Um, let's see what you guys know. Do you guys know what the graph would look like if I made a plot of brightness versus time for the sun? I'll use yellow for the sun. What would the what would the uh, brightness of the sun be like over time? This is actually one of our homework questions for the chapter on the sun. What does the brightness of the sun look like over time if you plot visible light? Christopher? I'm sorry? Geez, bud, something's going, looks oh. like it's, a, oh, hi, I can hear you now. <clears throat> okay, it would be a straight line. That's right, Christopher, you are good. Remember when we plotted the brightness of the sun, it was basically like a straight line with only small wiggles due to sunspots? That's what a single star should look like. Because if I glow because I'm hot is true, if the surface temperature of a star stays constant, the light output stays constant. So that's what we expect to see, Christopher. The idea behind an eclipsing binary, oh shoot, can I go back? Yeah. The idea behind an eclipsing binary goes like this. What if we plot the brightness, oh yeah? I like this as to I'm what's going on. Yeah, yeah, please, I want you. That's that yeah. you have one star that like from our perspective is getting blocked by the second star. So the light like, like changes because of that blocking by the other star. Exactly. And keep in mind, Christopher, that the first astronomers that did this, they just plotted the brightness of a single star. And they had to kind of construct that picture from the graph. For instance, they saw a graph where the star had a constant brightness. Then suddenly there was this big dip called the primary eclipse. Then there was a secondary dip called the secondary eclipse. And the process kept repeating itself, right? And the astronomers were probably really confused the first time because they were thinking, boy, this is really weird. Why would the brightness of a star, which should be constant, suddenly take a dip and then go back up and then take a smaller dip and then take a bigger dip and keep repeating the cycle? And you're exactly right, Christopher. It has to do with eclipses, right? So if you can see this picture here, let's go back up. <clears throat> When the two stars are side by side, you, you're only measuring the light from one star, of course, but you're getting the maximum amount of light. Can you guys see my picture here? No, you can't see this, Stacy, huh? What do you see right now, Stacy? A white screen. All right. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, that's because, okay. I understand why I did it. Okay. <clears throat> when the two stars are side by side, you still only see one star in the sky, but that the light of that star is getting contributions from the photosphere of the little star and the big star. So both stars contribute, and that's when you're at a maximum. <clears throat> when the little star goes in front of the big star, you're blocking this small fraction of the big star's photosphere. 
that gives you the secondary eclipse. Um, when the little star goes behind the big star, that's when you get the primary eclipse. That's when the light curve takes a big jump, right? Let's look at a zoom in on the primary uh, eclipse for just a moment, and you'll find there's some ex interesting details. So this is a time lapse of how the two stars will start to eclipse one another and what effects that would have on the light curve. <clears throat> so at first, the two stars in position A are side by side, and the brightness is at a maximum, which we call 1.0. The reality is that the brightness is probably 10 to the minus eight watts per square meter, but we normalize it and we say that's the 100% mark when both stars are contributing to the light of the binary. At point B called first contact, the little star is about to go behind the big star and be eclipsed. As its photosphere starts to disappear, we see the light steadily dropping as the photosphere of the little star starts to disappear behind the big star. <clears throat> Between second and third contact, the little star has been eclipsed. Third to fourth contact is when the little star reemerges and the light gradually returns to maximum. Now, you would think that you would get more light from the big star, but it's not always that simple. In the case of our binary, we're gonna be dealing with a little star which is higher temperature than the big star. So in other words, there's gonna be a little hot star, little guy is hot, and the big star is gonna be a big guy that's cool. In fact, the data that you're gonna be using today is real astronomical data for the star known as SS Bootes, otherwise known as SS Boo. And I want to show you some stuff here in the in the words, which I normally don't mess with, but we're going to need the words today. <clears throat> From spectroscopic data, uh, I'm reading over here, by the way, if you guys want to follow along with me. From spectroscopic data, <clears throat> it's been determined that the cooler star is a K-type subgiant. That basically means a type K red giant, whereas the hotter star is a G-type main sequence star. So the G-type star is little, but hot. The big star is big, but cool. <clears throat> um, they also tell us the period of the binary. And we're going to need that several times today. They tell us that the period of the binary, write this down in your margins somewhere, is 7.60614 days. You're going to need that number several times during this lab. <clears throat> All right. I'm here to tell you an interesting idea. We can use the change in time to estimate the radii of the stars. And see if you guys can follow me on this. This takes a little mental leap of logic, so I need you guys to work with me. What if I measure the time here and the time there? During that time, the little star will have like crossed behind the big star. But because we can use distance equals rate times time, we know that if it starts at time one and it stops at, well, let me try to clear this out again. From here, to here, the star will have traveled one cold star diameter. So this might not make any sense to you, but I can use this, this change in time from first to second contact to estimate how long the star took to eclipse. And if I use distance equals rate times time, that'll let me get the diameter of the star. Likewise, I can also measure this time the time from first contact <clears throat> to the time of third contact is a measurement of the radius of the big star, the cool star. Why? Because from first contact at B to third contact E, the little star will have completely traversed the cool star's diameter. So the difference in time can be used to estimate the relative radii of the stars. That's pretty cool because remember, we can't actually see the stars with our telescope. It's just a dot. 
but we can measure their radii through a light curve. That's what we're going to start off by doing together. All right, let's clear all drawings and let's see if I can share to my iPhone now. And now we're gonna to try to do something together. All of that was kind of like preamble so that you guys understand what I'm doing. <clears throat> share screen, iPhone. Let's hope this all works correctly. Okay. So I'm going to open up to the page that has the real data from SS Baotes. And that's this page here, 14 7. So could you all switch to 14 7 with me? <clears throat> now I want you to notice some things about this <clears throat> uh, graph. Sorry. Notice that the astronomers collecting the data from SS Botes, they actually just kept measuring the brightness of the star over and over again. And then they hired some graduate student slave, some graduate student computer to go and make a best fit plot of the primary eclipse. And no kidding, it looks just like the cartoon eclipse that we were looking at earlier. Um, where do you guys estimate the first contact is? I want this to be sort of up to the collective class. Um, we could start it like there or there or there. Where do we think this, the, the star first starts to be eclipsed? What's the point called first contact? Where do you guys think we should start it? <clears throat> Maybe I need to turn this uh, sideways. I've got to first identify the point of first contact. Where should that be? <clears throat> Can anyone talk me through that here? Does anyone know what the hell I'm talking about? I don't know how to say it, but like, I can see like two little dots on either side of the line. So like right there-ish. Maybe right there when it starts to dip. All right. <clears throat> I'm cool with that, Christopher. So let's be very careful as we draw this line. Let's line up our ruler with the point that Christopher said right after the two little dots. And keeping it to that line, I'm going to draw a line down. I'm going over it a few times so I can see it. This line is T1. That's the point of first contact. Um, the point of second contact is when the star becomes completely eclipsed. So Christopher, if you want to keep going there, where would you say the star becomes completely eclipsed? I need to like, get the lab thing, I think, right now, because um, okay. <clears throat> excuse me, anyone else? Caitlin, is anyone else sharing video with me here? Is it just Caitlin and Christopher? Are you guys my only friends? Caitlin, what do you think? Um. Sorry, I ended up going to my basement to get my paper. Uh, I've got the first line down, which you said is like um, like right in between those two little stars. Would the next one be like at the bottom corner? Yeah, I just want to know where we should stop. Remember, at the bottom trough here, that's where the star is completely eclipsed. And only the big, fat, cold star contributes to the light. But where would you say we loot? Here, we're still getting contributions to the light by the smaller, hotter star. Where would you say it completely yeah, stops right contributing? <laughs> that corner right there. Do you like this one or do you like yeah. that? No, I like the first one better. OK. So let's do that one since you like that one. Um, sorry, I'm trying to like. OK. I didn't want to lose the one that you said. So. <clears throat> I'm going to draw a best fit line right there. 
and I'm going to keep it right on the line, okay? That is T2. That's what we call second contact. We're also going to need third contact. Third contact is where the hot star begins to emerge again. So uh, Christopher Harita, uh, what do you think? Do you think it should be there or there? What's your idea? Uh, let's just go with the, the corner part of it. Um, Sorry. This or this? Uh, the first one. This one. Okay, fine. I think second line there. You think the second one? Put the second line, the line you just drew. Uh, what about it? Do you like it or, or what are you saying, Christopher? I don't understand. Oh, I just missed it, so I need to like. Oh, 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 I see. Sorry, you were clipped. So do you see it now? I got it. All right. And Chris suggests that we use this line here for a point of third contact. And that's T3. Does everyone have that? Okay. Um, I also need you to do one other line for me. That's this line here, horizontally from the bottom of the trough over. That line there. Now, remember, um, in our binary star, we have a big cool star, and we have a little hot star, right? And we're saying that the luminosities of both of them should be equal to 100%. The luminosity of the cold star plus the luminosity of the hot star have been normalized to 100%. We know that out here at 100%, both LC and LH are contributing to the light that we get from the light curve. What star is contributing down here, class? Which star contributes to the light curve down here? Is it the, the cool star? That's right, because the hot star is completely hidden at this point. Very, very good, uh, Caitlin. So let's write LC down there, OK? OK, class, let's talk about the sheet where we're going to fill out our data. Our data sheet will be right here, Wait, OK? Wait, sorry. Did we, do, did we do a T4 or no? No, we just, we're not going to need T4, Caitlin, so I decided to okay. skip it, all right? OK, thank you. Let's go up here to page 14-9. That is the data sheet, and this is the only sheet you'll need to turn into me. Let's put our name up at the top. This is lab number uh, eight, right? And don't forget that you are astronomy 1020. and write whatever your section is, All right? <clears throat> okay, now our first job is to get the relative luminosities of LC and LH. Let's just focus on the fact that Caitlin told us that only the cold star contributes to the luminosity. So we need this value. Can you guys tell me what that value is? What is that value? Do you know how to do this? Hey. 0 0.58. That's right. You broke this into 10 parts and that's 0 0.58. So that's LC. 
and that's relative arbitrary luminosity units. Um, you know that the total luminosity LC plus LH has to equal 100%. So if LC is 0.58, what should LH be? Point forty two. Yeah, because one minus point five eight should be point four two. Which star is more luminous, the cold star or the hot star? The cold star because it has more surface area. Exactly. Good connection to today's lecture. That's what I was going to see if you could connect that to today's lecture. Nicely done. Okay. Now, listen, guys, we have to get the values for T1, T2, and T3. But here's the deal. I'm worried that you guys might start to get freaked out trying to estimate which day you're at here. I want to teach you guys a really useful skill. This is a skill for life, okay? Um, if you have a number line and your number line has weird ticks on it, There is a surefire way to always figure out what each tick mark is worth. This is a big skill, so I want to teach it to you. Let's say the bottom is 0.5, and then uh, up here at the sixth tick mark, you had 0.6. This is kind of a weird interval because you have one, two, three, four, five, six tick marks in between. You take two printed numbers and you subtract them to find the interval. The interval is the subtraction of two printed numbers in the page. In this case, the interval is 0 0.6 minus 0 0.5 equals 0 0.1. Then what you do is you divide the interval by the number of boxes that you see in between. In this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 0.1 divided by 6 is, I should know this, but I don't, so I'll just punch, I'll punch, I'll punch it in, is 0 0.017. Each of these ticks has the awkward value of 0 0.017, but I mentioned this technique of interval divided by boxes. You do the interval divided by boxes because you can figure out the tick marks of any scale and it's very useful. So now that you've learned that technique for life, let's see if we can do that here. Um, Caitlin, give me some numbers for an interval. We got to pick two printed numbers. Which ones do you want to pick? Any two? Yeah, any two on the x-axis here. Oh, okay. Um, let's do 331.8 and then the 332.0. Okay, good idea. And what is the interval if we do 332.0 minus 331.8? What does our interval turn out to be? One second. Zero point two. I'm bad at math. <laughs> That's okay. That's what the calculator is. Zero point two days, right? Yes. Okay. Now you've got to count the boxes between those two. Could you count the boxes from three thirty one to three thirty two for me? Yeah. One second. Twenty boxes. Okay, so we do 0.2 days divided by 20 boxes or 20 ticks, whatever, or let's say 20 boxes. Um, and then what do you get? Zero point zero one. And the units are zero point zero one. Days. 
But Tiger days, Rocha left your photo. <laughs> <laughs> that's thank God that's all it was. I, I live in fear of the day someone sends me a very inappropriate text uh, during my class. Uh, days per days per box. <laughs> Okay, so with that in mind, Caitlin, or anyone else who wants to help Caitlin and me, if this is 331.8, what would three tick marks back be? What, what is T1? Do you know how to do that? Well, all you do is for each tick mark, you subtract 0 0.01. So what would the tick mark just before 331.8 be? to minus 0.01. A nine. Sorry, Christopher, you started off messed, uh, you're, 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 say it again. Hello? I can hear you now. 31.79. Exactly. You could think of this as 331.80. If you subtract 0.01, this will be 331.79. What will this one be? Seven, eight. Three, three, one point seven, eight. What will this one be? Point seven, seven. And that's what our T1 is. Three, three, one point seven, seven. Okay, let's see if we can get the hang of this here. What will T2 be with that in mind? Thank you, Christopher, Caitlin, and Chris for playing along with me, by the way. Or, or is anyone else sharing video? I can't. Oh, Stacy's there too. Yes. And thank you, Stacy, as well. Stacy, what do you think? What should that line be? What is this value? I think, hold on, I'm still figuring it. So it would be 0 0.01 times, I think it's, what is it, 14? Uh, 14? Right, but what should I write down here? All right, I just want to make sure. Um, 0.14 plus. Here, Stacy, can I recommend three, an easier way to do this? Yes. Let's think We're of this as 332.00. Three, zero, zero. And go backwards. And so what would the one before it be? Um, it would be, so it would be point zero. so it would be Three two eight. No, it wouldn't be. It'd be three three Here. one point. I'm on the right track. Okay. <laughs> Wait, now I forgot. Three three one point five. Point nine nine. Point nine nine. Because you're only subtracting a hundredth. Good. Okay. So this is three three one point nine nine. What's this one? Sorry, three three one point nine eight. Nine seven, nine, nine six. six, nine five, three nine three four. one point nine four. I just want you guys to learn how to do this because it's a useful skill. Not only in astronomy but in general. Okay, what would you guys say T three is in your best estimate there? What would you say T3 is? 332.8. Three, 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 yeah. Uh, 987. Yeah. 332.15. Three, three, nice. You guys got these values? Okay. Now we're going to have to do a little math here. Okay. Um, we can follow along with some of these formulas, but some of them have typos. So we got to watch out, okay?
Okay. We are going to use distance equals rate times time. And we're basically going to figure out the relative radii of the stars using these two formulas. The idea is that if we multiply pi times the time difference and we divide it by the period, the ratio of the time difference to the period will be the ratio of, of the star traveling. We're basically saying what fraction of the period did the star travel around where this is the circumference of the star and this is like T2 to T1. And we'll, we're basically figuring out the relative radii in terms of the circumference of the orbit. A little bit abstract. Let's get the scale radii. So we do the cold star is pi times T3 minus T1 over the period 7.60614 days. So T3 is 332.15. So we'll do pi times open parentheses 332.15 minus T1 331.77. Close parentheses, and then we'll divide by the period 7.60614. And I don't know if that's what you guys got, but I round it to 0 0.16, okay? Can you guys do the hot star for me and prove that you can handle this? T2 minus T1 over P? Why don't you guys get me that value while I grab a tissue? What you got? Oh. Sorry? Um. Christopher, I think there's a wire that's loose in your headset because when you start talking, it's like glitchy and then I kind of hear you come in. Yeah, my other headset broke, so I had to borrow my mom's headset, which is also broken. <laughs> Classic. Classic. Um, now that I'm hearing you, do you want to try and tell me what you got again? 0.16. Uh, that's what I got for RC. What did you get for RH? Did I do the wrong one? You have to do T2 minus T1 this time. Crap. Okay. Pi times. Okay, Lynn, what'd you get? It looks like you were doing some punching. I can't hear you, buddy. I couldn't find my like camera for a second. Oh. Um, I got zero point zero two. Mm, okay. Let's see if we can do the got same thing. Zero point zero seven. That's what I was expecting. So Caitlin, watch me do it just to see if you did anything different than me, okay? Um, I'm gonna do pi times open parentheses, 331.94 minus 331.77, close parentheses, divide by 7.60614. You might have typed in some wrong numbers somewhere. Did it work out this time? Yeah, it worked out this time. I, I must have hit a wrong button somewhere. That's OK. I bet you might have transposed one of these numbers. That happens sometimes. All right, this tells us the relative radii of the two stars. Basically, this means the cold star is 16% of the complete circumference of orbit. So the cold star is 16% of the circumference of orbit. Whereas the hot star is only 7% of the circumference of orbit. Okay, now that's as much as we can get from the eclipsing data. To get more information, we're going to need to use spectroscopy. 
Now, the way this works is in an eclipsing binary, usually you take the spectrum of the star. And if you take a single spectrum, just like any star, you see a whole bunch of absorption lines. Well, if you keep taking the picture over and taking the spectrum over and over again, you discover that there's actually two sets of absorption lines and that they shift back and forth with respect to each other. This indicates you have a Doppler shift going back and forth with the two stars. Luckily for us, we don't actually have to analyze the spectra because we hired our graduate students to do that for us. And they came up with a, a radial velocity curve that looks something like this. Okay. Um, we didn't really talk about the Doppler shift yet. I, I realized I forgot to do that. I was gonna include a discussion of the Doppler shift during the binary star lecture, but then we had glitches today. So you're gonna to have to go with me, okay? Now the filled in circles, they represent the cool star. The open circles, they represent the hot star. What we can see happening is we can see that the cool star first has a positive velocity, meaning it's moving away from us. And then it changes direction and it has a negative velocity, meaning it's heading towards us. Meanwhile, the other star is doing the exact opposite in the synchronized swim. The hotter star moves towards us, negative velocity, and then it changes direction to positive velocity and it moves away from us. Our goal is to start off to find the center of mass velocity, which they have weirdly called gamma. Gamma is the center of mass velocity, and it is clearly not zero because when I draw a best fit line through the center of the two stars velocities, and I'm going to do that by drawing this line here, notice I'm carefully making sure to not bias it towards a line, but to go through the center of the curve. Oh, I kind of did a shitty job. Um, hey, so I think, think, I think you're frozen. Yeah. Are you frozen again? What? Don't give me this crap. No. Like my phone's frozen? Yeah, yeah. On the screen. It's a sign. It's a sign that that Odin doesn't want us to do this lab. The gods it's are only angry. showing the bottom uh, numbers on the thing saying Hold on. like Let the different stop. hotter star. Can you see me now? Yeah. yeah, your video was fine on the side. It was just the, the phone video was frozen. All right, let's see if I can get back in there. Thanks, guys. Thanks for keeping me up to date on that. Um, all right, that's good. OK, I'm going to try to draw. Uh, I'm going to try to draw the center of mass velocity, which clearly goes right through the center of these two curves. We have to draw a line. We don't want to bias it towards the top box or the lower box, towards the top box, the lower box. We want to be able to get right in the middle there. And I didn't do such a good job the first time around. So I'm going to try it again. That's a little better. OK. We've got to figure out what this velocity is. Um, Caitlin was our expert last time. Uh, Stacy, why don't you try? What's the interval here? we got to figure out what each tick mark is worth. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean by the interval, Stacy? I do. I'm just honestly, I'm getting a headache, and this is really not. I'm trying to turn off the lights and everything. I'm just. This is really bothering me today. I don't know why, but well, I will. I will I'm, stay with you here. I'm so sorry. I can call on That's someone else. Your fault. No, it's all good. I got this. Um, point two. So there's ten tick marks. Oh, where's my phone? Oh, wait, Stacy. We want to do the y-axis. We want to do the velocity axis here. Oh, we're gonna. Okay. 
So it'd be 50 divided by 10. Exactly. Divided by 10, which is five, dear Lord. I used a calculator, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Five I kilometers. Know. I know, I know. It's five kilometers per second per box, okay? So what would you guys estimate this is? If this is negative, all right, we have to look close here. If this is negative 50 and that's negative 45, what should kind of in between be? Negative uh, 7.5 or 47.5. Yeah, except I don't think we have that much resolution. Sorry, this is probably me messing up. Stacy, um, are you sure it's not negative 47.6? Sure. No, do you see what I mean? Like, I believe in your mind's eye, Christopher. I believe you are capable of breaking this into five places. I do not believe you're capable of breaking it accurately into 50 places. So why don't you choose negative 47 or negative 48? Sorry. You fuzzed out. Caitlin, Chris, could you guys help? Someone's chatting here. Negative 48. Okay, fine. That will be our agreed upon center of mass velocity. I want you guys to have some agency over this, okay? Do you understand why I chose negative 48 over negative 47.5, Christopher? I did not believe you had that resolution to choose the 0.5, although whatever. Okay, now I need you guys to do some weird stuff for me. Follow along, things are gonna get a little screwy. We've got to draw lines at 0.25, 0.2, Point, sorry. Yeah, at 0.25 and at 0.75. We want lines at quarter phase and at three quarter phase. Um, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 divided by 10 boxes is 0.2 divided by 10 or 0 0.02. So that's 0.22, that's 0.24 and that right there there is 0 0.25. I'm gonna draw a line at 0.25 top to bottom. Uh, look what a crummy job I did. I actually kind of drew, I need a better holder here. Actually, let's go vertical. So I'm just trying to figure out how to make this all work for you guys. All right, you know what it's gonna do? Uh, and let's also draw a line at 0.75. 0.7, These represent the velocities of each star with respect to the center of mass velocity. By the way, the center of mass velocity, negative 48, means the two binary stars are actually moving towards the observer. They're spinning around each other, but the system is moving towards Earth. Okay, this is gonna be alpha cold, and this is gonna be alpha hot. I should probably use pen for this, because you guys aren't gonna be able to see this very well. I'll label this as alpha cold. I'll label this one as alpha hot, the betas will be the velocities towards the observer. This is beta hot, and this is beta cold. 
Let me go sideways so you can see all that. So I labeled, oops. Alpha cold, alpha hot, beta hot, and beta cold. Did you guys do something like that? Okay. We have to figure out the values of alpha hot, alpha cold, uh, beta cold, beta hot. Do you guys know how to do this? Alpha cold is from here to there, the center of mass. How do we find an interval? Through subtraction. So what's this value here? What is this tick mark? 25 kilometers. Say that again, Chris. 25 kilometers per second. But remember, to get the interval, we have to do y2 minus y1, right? So alpha cold, hold on. Alpha cold is positive 25 kilometers per second minus the center of mass, which is negative 48 kilometers per second. What will that equal? Christopher, say it again. 73. Yeah. Notice that the alpha hot does not go quite up to 25. Uh, Christopher Leonard, what would you say that that thing peaks out at? A little bit closer. Huh? This is positive 25, but what's this guy? positive 20. So what would you say that is? Sorry, Christopher, you got to say it again because your headset's messed up. Couldn't someone else also participate? No, Christopher, I want to hear what you Oh, you did you text it? Yeah, positive 23. So what would that make your alpha hot then? Well, you guys obviously know, right? So we can move on. 71. Very good. Positive 71. The betas want to be negative. So we want to actually subtract the low one minus the center of mass. Do you guys notice that both of these kind of top bottom out at the same value? They bottom out at what value? One twenty-five. Negative one twenty-five. So beta cold is equal to beta hot. Negative one twenty-five minus negative forty-eight. What's that equal? Okay, I'll have to do it since you're not doing it. Minus 48 negative equals. Is that right? 125 negative minus 48 negative. Negative 77. Okay. One of the rules 
for binary stars is that the ratio of the masses is the inverse ratio of their velocities. So mass hot over mass cold is alpha cold plus beta cold over alpha hot plus beta hot. So the mass ratio here will be alpha cold 73 plus negative 77 over 71 plus negative 77. Probably ought to put that on parentheses. Can you guys add that up and tell me what you get? Negative four over negative six. Which is what? 0 0.67. Good job, Chris. Defer. Does the mass ratio have a uh, unit on the end? No, because mass it's ratio. a ratio, right? It means the hot star is 67% the mass of the cold star. All right, here's where there's a type. Oh, fuck. Oh, sorry, guys. The, the velocity is the relative velocity alpha hot minus beta cold. But if you guys look, alpha hot is a little bit lower. We should actually do alpha cold uh, plus, minus beta hot. Alpha cold minus beta hot gives us a bigger spread. Basically, I want to do the biggest possible difference in velocities. So the relative velocity should be positive 73 minus negative 77. Which is 150 kilometers per second. Now we get to the whole point of a binary star. The whole point of a binary star is to find the mass of the star. And we're going to use a cheap version of NK3. The total mass of the system is A cubed over P squared, where A must be in astronomical units and P must be in years. If we do that, the total mass will come out in solar mass units. To find the separation A, we're going to want to use the binary star formula. And let me write that down a little neater here. A will equal 0 0.211. That's going to convert um, to AUs from kilometers. Sorry, AUs per year from kilometers per second times the velocity times the period. all divided by two times pi times 365.25 days per year. And this will make our velocity come out to be AU. The velocity is 150 kilometers per second and the period is 7.606 days. So let's punch this in, 0.211 times 150 times 7.606 divided by 2 divided by pi divided by 365.25 and I get 0 0.10 astronomical units. That's the separation between my two binary stars. Okay. Now let's find the total mass of the system. The total mass of the system is A cubed over P squared or 
0 0.1 AU cubed over 7.606 divided by 365.25 squared. That'll convert to years. Damn it. Wow. My brain is mush today, guys. Sorry, this is kind of a tricky lab. Can you guys punch that up and tell me what you get? Chris, I can't hear you. Chris texts that, yes, Christopher, I got the same thing. Two point three solar mass units. We're almost done, kids. Okay, now we have to do a game called Two Equations, Two Unknowns. We know that the ratio of the hot star mass to the cold star mass is 0 0.67. We also know that the total mass, the mass of the hot star plus the mass of the cold star is 2.3 solar mass units. This is a little game called two equations, two unknowns. First, we're gonna solve for the mass of the hot star. The mass of the hot star is 67% the mass of the cold star. And I'm gonna plug that into the mass of the hot star up there to get 0.67 mass of cold star plus the mass of the cold star equals 2.3 solar masses. Here I can do six, seven plus, this is secretly one, which gives me 1.67 times the mass of the cold star equals 2.3 solar mass units. The mass of the cold star is then 2.3 divided by 1.67 solar masses. Could you guys take that ratio for me? Oh, uh, why do you have to type it? Can't you say it? Fine. 1.4 solar masses. If the sum of the masses is 2.3, what does that make the mass of the hot star? What is 2.3 minus 0.4? 0 0.9. Okay. So both stars are close to one solar mass, but the hot star is a little less massive than the cold star. Now to get the radii, we do a nice easy formula here at the end. It's the scale radius times the semi-major axis times this number, which converts from AUs to solar radii. So it's solar radii per AU. So the cold star RC times A 
times basically 215 solar radii per AU. Now the cold star radius was 16% of the semi-major axis times the semi-major axis, which is 0.1 AU. Sorry. Times two fifteen solar radii per AU. Three point four. Okay. And same thing for the radius of the hot star, except this time it's seven percent of a tenth of an AU times 215. 1.5. And now let's take stock of what we've done. It was kind of a nasty little math exercise and I'm sure you guys hated it, but we went from light curve data and spectroscopic data. We now know the masses of each star, the radii of each star, and we at least know the relative luminosities of the two stars. This is why binary stars are good for us. We can use the details of physics to get fundamental parameters of the star. We will be doing stuff like this on the exam, but it won't be quite this complicated. I'll make the problems more simple. Okay, I'm sure you hated that. It's kind of a rough lab. But guess what? It's a little more real. So take a photo of just this page. All I need from you guys is this, okay? I guess that's as good a time as any. Is everyone good on these parameters here? All right, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to glue those videos together, but I'm gonna try. Um, I guess it won't matter to you guys because you're already done. Will you please turn your homeworks in right away? I don't know who else is out there. Uh, participants, how do, I, how do I show the trolls for a second? I wanna see how many trolls we got. Okay, we lost a lot of people there, but um, okay, guys. Happy freaking Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>